two guys of Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. Out over the plate. Um, he's a big, strong, athletic guy. He can get to different pitches in the zone. He can hit pitches that are a little up in the zone. He can stay on pitches that are down in the zone. Like I said, he, he is capable of a lot. And we got a chance to see, you know, some of the different things that he can do. Uh, if he starts, you know, locking in on this sort of approach, I mean, there's no limit on what uh, what we could see from him. He, he's an extraordinarily uh, talented hitter, um, and that's what the production looks like when he gets going. It's Kepler there, right? Yes, talking okay. about Max Kepler. Yep. So I guess we could open the state of the Twins here, uh, usually on a Monday, but thank you guys for uh, giving us a few days to take a pause and uh, enjoy, uh, I don't know, drinking with friends and family and whatever. But, Judd, you could apologize now to Max Kepler, or you could wait till later in the show. It's, it's up to you. Want, do you want to start with your well, hold apology, on second, or do you want, you want to do it toward the end? Or what, what Wait, you... I'm fielding calls on behalf of Falvey. <laughs> I think I'm close okay. to a deal to get a top 20 prospect, probably the 19th best prospect from any team I possibly can. Oh, okay. So you're, I'm trying, using this, you're trying to flip him while he's hot, I'm using basically. the surge. Okay. I am using the surge to, yes, <laughs> to flip him before the inevitable next huge slump arrives. I don't know that that's how this front office would view it, which we, we can talk about well, some of this stuff you. here. I do agree with you. This is our weekly State of the Twins discussion here, presented by our friends at Modest Brewing, just steps away from Target Field in the North Loop, Minneapolis. And uh, if you go in, you know, we, we were there actually last week, a little, mm-hmm. little show meeting, a little sales and show meeting at Modest. So you can stop in just steps away from Target Field in Declan's old neighborhood. He longs to be uh, close to Modest again. Yeah. I do, uh, especially in these hot days. We already had like, what, 13, 90 degree days here in the Twin Cities and a nice little Supra Deluxe. That'll, call, oh. that'll, that'll cool you down on a hot summer day, especially got the birds coming to town later this week at Target Field, too. So go to Modest Brewing, get a nice cold one and enjoy uh, that great patio as well. The Supra Deluxe Premium Lager. You can also get 19 ounce stove pipes of Modest in mm. uh, uh, various liquor stores. So check them out. Modestbrewing.com helping to power the State of the Twins discussions. So let's start with the overall snapshot, then we'll get into the different categories, and we will wrap as we will do now every week with uh, an immaculate grid attempt, see if we can pull off the immaculate grid by going nine for nine. But overall snapshot, Twins are 44 and 43, game above 500. They're one game up on the Gardos. The Twins offense, 22nd in runs per game right now, but the Twins defense or Twins run prevention, pitching and fielding, is first in fewest runs allowed per game as of this morning. They lead the major leagues in run prevention. It's kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Baseball reference gives the Twins a 75% chance to make the playoffs, 3.5% to win it all. Fangrass gives the Twins a 64% chance to make the playoffs, 3% to win it all. Category number one, boys. Let's just jump right into it because I know this is what Judd wants to talk about, and it's the most fascinating things that I've seen just like in the quotes the Twins' new offensive approach. <laughs> so before the Baltimore series, when they went to Baltimore, they took two out of three last weekend. They had a closed-door meeting after the Atlanta debacle, and they, they basically had a player mutiny. The, the, the Twins are trying to frame it differently, but the players decided, we are going to take over the hitting strategy meetings before each game. We are going to run the meetings. We're going to talk strategy, and then... If David Popkins and coaches want to chime in, that's fine, but we're going to flip this. We're not just going to sit and listen anymore. And so this is from The Athletic. I'm going to read this and get your thoughts on this. And by the way, they're 4-1 and one in the new season. And they had a couple offensive outbursts against Baltimore. Obviously, they've scored some runs against Kansas City. Twins players seem to be in unison liking the feel of their new hitters meetings. Whereas before the daily sessions were run by the coaching staff providing a plan of attack and detailed scouting report of what to expect, the, the, the team's hitters are now directing the meetings. Most players agree not much is different. Correa said he still relies heavily on David Popkins for an idea of how teams will attack him when he's at the plate. By the way, it sounds like things are very different. So the coaches are no longer running meetings. Well, yeah, just the keep players that in mind. Are running meetings, yes. Okay? Yep. Yet, unlike before, players are sharing opinions on what certain pitchers will look like and how they plan to attack, which as a guy who covered Major League Baseball 
on a beat for a number of years. It's weird that they weren't doing that the first part of the season. Yes. It's super weird, actually. Byron Buxton said, quote, it happened behind closed doors because that's where it's supposed to stay. Nothing has changed. It's just us running our own meeting, taking accountability in what we do, because at the end of the day, that's our careers. For us, we're the ones that go play day in and day out. It's up to us to keep coming together and finding ways to produce. Basically saying, it's our careers. We'll take the drivers. We'll take the steering wheel here, mm -hmm. and we'll drive the car. So, and I know Judd, you have there, you, there's even more stuff coming out the last oh, couple yeah. of days, but I'll stop there for a second. What do you and and they're four and one since they had this come well, to Jesus meeting. What do you think? Well, uh, first of all, they they met on was it Thursday after mm -hmm. the Braves after the final Braves loss, and then on Friday exploded for eight runs against Baltimore, and then had back to back games of one run in each game, one one lost one again, yeah. again not to ignore this fact the pitching has been unbelievable. Okay. So, like, just to, just to be very clear here, the Twins pitching deserves support that goes well beyond a run. Now, I know that in the past two games, I think they have 17 runs against Kansas City, uh, but Kansas City is an absolute dumpster fire, so let's wait until they actually play good teams again. But, Phil, this goes, and again, to go back to what you said, I guess, as well, uh, as a guy who covered a beat, the red flags in these quotes, the alarms, the bells go going off about what's truly transpiring here, um, speak to far more than uh, our approach at the plate's not right. Let's let's alter that by basically ignoring our guy, David Popkins, okay? Yeah. So this all started, if you recall, there was the game about a week or so ago uh, before, unfortunately, he, he suffered a strained oblique that's going to keep him out for six weeks now. Royce Lewis came pretty clean and talked about his approach in a game at Detroit where he said, I told good old poppy i said poppy here's what i'm going to do a lot of green out there i'm going to be louisa rise today and i'm going to go hit which is a clear indictment not just of popkins but of the strategy right but do you remember and i don't know if we brought this to the show or not but when they closed when rocco said the players are meeting you're not i'm not going to allow the media in there today okay that goes far beyond in my opinion just a closed door let's hash out our approach at the plate session because we have all been around teams when they have closed the door. And for the most part, they then open them. And you can at least go talk to a couple of guys. Okay. Mm -hmm. Rocco basically said, everybody today, off limits. I'm going to rip the team, which is great. That's absolutely fine. But I want to give you a couple of things here that I think, and Buxton alluded to this by trying not to, that allude to what really probably took place here which went far beyond, in my opinion, approach at the plate. Mm -hmm. The first is, is this. Game on Monday tied 3-3 in the eighth. Edward Julian came up, pinch hit, homered to make it 4-3 in what became an 8-4 win. But here's his quote. And this is why I love young people, because Royce Lewis <laughs> and Julian don't know exactly what to say and what not to say. So they're just pretty upfront about it. And they're not yeah. like purposely trying to torch anybody. They're just saying this is what I, I did. Julian's quote. I was sitting on the couch in the clubhouse and they yelled, Eddie, you are leading off because he was going to pinch it. I rushed back to the dugout, couldn't find my elbow guard. I just picked up a random elbow guard, put it on and had no idea who the pitcher was or what the pitcher had. I just swung. So this is basically him saying, like, think of the, these meetings that they have, right? And the approach. I'm just going to go be a be a ball player. Yes, kind of I'm just going to go hit the ball. Rice I don't Lewis, even know. Same thing. I'm just going to just let me just let me put the bat on the ball. Like, just let me put the bat on the ball. Yeah, exactly. I don't even know who Taylor Clark, who was Kansas City's pitcher that night, was. But you know what? I'm going to go up there and I'm going to hit with with a friend's uh, elbow guard, <laughs> and he hits a home run. Now, to me, that's very close to what Roy said, which is. Yeah, you know, we can talk all we want about launch angle and all of all of these things, but unless you let us just be ball players to use your term, it's not going to work as well. And so I thought that that quote, while not an indictment, like he didn't mean it as an indictment of anybody, yeah, is incredibly intriguing because his point was I had no clue what this guy was throwing. I thought I I think he thought that he was going to pinch it fourth if they came to that guy in the order. So he just goes up there and just swings and hits a home run. Very, yeah. very telling to me. And real quick, and do you have another quote too? Uh, well, look. yes, but it's on well, a different. It it 
takes it a step beyond this one. So go ahead. Let me jump in real quick because, and I, I, this is just sort of educated speculation. I don't know what exactly went on behind closed doors. There, there's been some hints. We obviously know that they've changed the structure of how they're meeting and strategizing and it may or may not have paid off. They're definitely like winning some games here, but like you said, they, it's not like they're averaging eight runs a game here in the last, they've had a couple offensive outbursts, which is nice, but over the last 20 years, the battle in front offices has evolved from 20 years ago. It was who can get the most information. Can you get information through, you know, track man data through just different. Can you bring smart people in to decipher essentially the analytical code of baseball launch angle spin rate on pitches, right? It was sort of an informational gathering arms race, 2001, 2005, 2010. Mm-hmm. the last 10 to 15 years it's been more about like everyone has access to the same tools and information like there's there's really no stone left to turn over when it comes to gathering information on a baseball field there's player movement data there's pitch tracking data there's everything it's about disseminating the information hey here's what we know about our opponent and disseminating it to sometimes like 22 25 year old guys who are ball players, man. Like they, they didn't like go to college or anything. It, they're just baseball players. And so you, as a front office, as a coaching staff, oh my God, you guys, look at this barrel of, right. look at all this information. We've cracked the code. We've cracked the code of you know, our opponent. We can, here's all the information. And I wonder, just educated speculation here, have the twins been lacking in terms of on the hitting side, at least on the pitching side, it seems like they've <laughs> they've got something down here with the players they've acquired and like their number one in run prevention. But I just wonder on the hitting side if it just became like Carlos Correa, Byron Buxton, all these guys, even Royce Lewis, like oh, blah, 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 just ah, just let me go play baseball, let me go hit. You know that's that's the sense I'm getting from these conversations and from like the little clues that, that are being dropped by some of the young players too it's just, and it's not necessarily fire everyone it's just okay let's we're all there's some good talented people here why is it do they have too many things going on in their head are they being asked to do something that doesn't fit their strength maybe we should take a step back and the, i love that the players initiated this and just go be ourselves there's a reason why Carlos Correa makes $35 million a year and has been, you know, highly coveted as a free agent, if not for the ankle. There's a reason why Royce Lewis was the number one overall pick. There's a reason why Byron Buxton, right? Like, let them play baseball. And I wonder if that was the breaking point. I think that probably played a a role. And to go back to our discussion about this last week as well, you know, keep in mind, David Popkin's strength would be exactly what you just said. It's not like he had this big league career where he can be like, you know, against Clemens in my day, here's what I did. Like so, so his strength would be coming with a lot of in- information. I also think it's that's very tough to do from a hitting approach because one size does not fit all. Like everybody's different and approaches are different. And so, if you are literally going in and saying, "Here's what the guy has. Here's what we need to do. Here's what we need. Here's what our swings need to look like. Mm-hmm. Here's what." Okay, that might fit of the nine guys we're going to hit that day, that might fit one or two. Like Royce Lewis and Julian and guys like that, they're just trying to swim. Like yeah. they're not thinking advanced, advanced, advanced. They are literally just getting here and, and and basically saying, if you take away my strength, you're weakening me. And so, yeah. But the other quote I've got is a Kepler quote. And this speaks to, and I think this is a little bit what Buxton is alluding to, but didn't talk about. There And this is not a complete shock, given how, from an offensive approach, how dead-ass this team looked for so long. Because, again, there is no excuse for this team with some of the guys that that they have to have had as many one- or two-run games as they do. So Kepler, who now has – and I think Corey Provost said on the broadcast yesterday that Rocco was talking to him on his uh, pregame show that they do – and Rocco said, we sat down again. So this is a theme with Max. Max gets a talking to. 
Max goes to the principal's office and Max comes out and Max is on his best behavior. There's no more detention problems until the next time that Max sort of falls asleep in class. Okay. He's like, he's like one of the oldest guys in the lineup, but they talked to him <laughs> like after that 30 years old, man, that goofy Tampa Bay decision he, he made on the base pass, which infuriated Rocco. Yeah. And I know he got a talking to there. And I want to say for a couple of days after that, now we're trying to blame this on Kepler coming back either too quickly or not having a rehab assignment, but I'm not completely buying that. Here's the Kepler quote, though. So off of the meeting in Atlanta, Kepler said, according to Dan Hayes in the athletic piece that he wrote for today, says, Kepler says the result is enhanced communication and players making better eye contact. Hmm? Okay, so first of all, that's that's what Kepler said. That's paraphrasing. But that's what Kepler said. Better eye contact. Not with the ball. I'm talking better eye contact with each other. And here's the quote. And this is where it gets, this is where I think, this is why they closed the doors that went far beyond, let's talk about our approach at the plate. Kepler said, having each other's backs, communicating has been a big, communicating has been a big one for us, moving as a unit. It feels like we're moving as a unit more so and feeding off each other's success. I see one guy get a knock. I see another guy steal a base. It riles me up, gets me going. I think in the past it might have felt a little disconnected or people were out to get more individual accomplishments done. Hmm. Um, now it feels like we're really rooting for each other and it's a good feeling. Sounds like the old wild guard. That yeah, sounds like Parise Suter 2.0 from, from towards the end of their run here. This is so interesting because baseball, if you let it, can really just be an individual matchup sport. Mm-hmm. It's you got nine guys in the lineup and each one has a matchup with the starting pitcher and they kind of play off each other a little bit. And that if there's a runner on base, maybe you want to move them over or something. But in a really analytics heavy organization where you're not really the twins don't steal bases as much. They don't like I, think about the nature of some of the team aspects of baseball, which are few and far between. Because, again, it really is. A, it's an individual sport. It's me versus the pitcher you know, 40 times a game or whatever it is. A stolen base is me saying, hey, I'm going to get into position so you can drive me in. I'm going to get you an RBI. If you're on second base and I decide I'm a right-handed hitter, I'm going to hit a ground ball to the right side or a fly ball to the right side so you can go from second to third. That's a team thing, right? Yes. But but a lot of the analytics-heavy front offices and teams say stolen bases – Unless, unless you know you can grab like eighty five percent success rate, really we're gonna we're gonna shut that down. We don't want to be making outs on the base pass, and you shouldn't be sacrificing yourself by hitting a ground ball for an out. You should be trying to hit the ball to the warning track every time. If you if you if you're not careful, and this is where a manager's job comes in, and this is all of this is sort of an indictment on Rocco too. A manager's job isn't to call plays, or and yeah, like there's bullpen moves. But that's only a fraction of it. A manager's job in baseball is really hard to quantify. But it's how can you get a clubhouse of 26 guys performing as close to their peak capability as possible? Culture building, communication, information, uh, dissemination, right? All these things. And it feels like all of that glue is missing from this team. And, 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 it's, and now they're all looking around like, and by the way, this isn't just a this year problem. The Twins have underachieved for three years. And it has felt like kind of a, ro a robotic, uh, glueless thing at times. And so I love that some of this is coming out. And maybe this is like, maybe this is their wake-up call. Maybe now they're realizing there's some human element things at play here. Information overload doesn't help a guy who's trying to get up there and just make contact with a 97-mile-an-hour moving fastball, right? You know, yes. just like be, being there for each other, getting someone's back, celebrating someone else's success. Those are all things that can't be quantified through a, an Excel spreadsheet or some sort of, you know, track man software. And he, here's the second part of the same quote. So Kepler, because this is the thing, when Kepler gets going, he's actually a great quote. He doesn't get going a lot and, and he's an aloof type of dude. But there's a certain like non, like he doesn't really think about, I can't say this or, or that at times. The second part is, uh, of the same quote after a pause here, because there's ellipses in the story. There might have been some quote. There might have been some miscommunication through some of the stretches here in the past. But when everyone's communicating, when everyone's being honest with one another, 
looking each other in the face and trying to learn from one another, then people come together and grow. It's all human element stuff, man. Right. It's and it all goes human but, element stuff. But I mean, it goes far beyond um, I think simple approach at the plate. And I'm with you. This comes back on Baldelli. Like he's the guy who has to galvanize this thing, make it work. And he's the one who has to, and people joke about this, but there has to be some accountability at times as well. And if there's none until it's too late, that becomes a problem. And this is interesting too, because this was talked about a lot. We couldn't quantify it because at the time Paul Deli was new, but you know what this also speaks to? What a huge difference Nelson Cruz made in this clubhouse in 2019. Well, he's av- he's available again as of I, yesterday. I don't. I'm not <laughs> suggesting they do that. I'm just. I'm just saying this is this to me is crystallizing what a lot of the twins' problems, or what yeah. some of their problems have been. Yeah, and it's God. There's it. This is all so interesting, and all we're, we're sort of just left to read the tea leaves and and read between the lines. But um, really interesting that they've clearly reached a kind of a breaking point internally, and they've come back at small sample size. They've won four out of five, so we'll see how this manifests the rest of the season. But next category kind of goes in line here. Don't waste this pitching. Yeah. So like we said, they are now number one in run prevention, runs allowed per game, number one in Major League Baseball. They're third in strikeout rate as a pitching staff, third in lowest walk rate. So they're striking everyone out. They're not walking hitters as often as other teams. The fourth lowest home run rate allowed. So you're preventing walks, you're preventing home runs. Like it's it's everything that you would want. And they're eighth on the fielding side. They're eighth in defensive runs saved. If you take away like the pitching stuff, the strikeouts, the walks, the home runs allowed. If you just like among batted balls, they're eighth in defensive runs saved. So I don't recall a twins pitching and fielding unit that was collectively. Now there's things we could poke holes in, right? I mean, like, you know, they've they got a couple hack infielders. Not Roy, Royce Lewis is out for a while. So, like, Miranda's at third and Julian, you know. Like, there's definitely things to nitpick on the fielding side. But, obviously, you can nitpick the 29 other teams more than the Twins because the Twins are number one in run prevention. So, the crazy thing is, with all the flaws and weird behind-the-scenes closed-door meetings and stuff, you can win a World Series if you are the best team in Major League Baseball at preventing runs. That's the bonkers thing about this season so far. Yeah, and that's where you, I, sometimes I get a little frustrated with it, but it's actually true with this team because of how well they pitch. You know, I saw Perk and Bramer were talking about this in yesterday's game. If the Twins get to four runs, they're probably going to win the game just because their pitching has been so damn good. And I can't remember a time that the Twins pitching staff was really this deep and good in my lifetime. Like, for sure, Johan Santana was the best pitcher I have ever seen, and Lariano at his peak in 06 was also a really damn good complimentary piece. But one through five, I trust these guys pretty damn well. And even with numerous division champions and playoff appearances and all the 18-game losing streak, this pitching staff as a whole is better than those pitching staffs, which I think if the Twins just get to three to four runs in a playoff game, I actually really like their chances to probably win that most of the time. But this is why you also have to to make sure that this is not a short-term fix. Baltimore is struggling, and you did just score 10 runs in three, three games, eight in one game. Kansas City's not good. This We need to see this now as, as a whole because the pitching has been an extremely large sample size. We need to see this team, and I and we need to see them hit and score runs consistently, or you have to consider a couple, I think, of big options here. One is, is the right person running this team? Because keep in mind, too, the interesting thing about this entire thing is Rocco has nothing to do currently with the solution. The solution is in, is from in the clubhouse. It's from the players. Um, when you say they, running the team, you mean the manager or do you mean Falvey? I mean, no, I mean for right now. If you think this team can win playoff games, Rocco might not be the guy to win playoff games. Now, they're never going to fire him, but my point is this. The headline to your your second part of this, Phil, is exactly right. Don't waste this pitching. Well, to, to your point real quick here about Rocco, because I think there's a lot of a lot of people defend Rocco because, well, he's just an extension of the front office. Okay, but like a lot of the things that were clearly now that the curtain's being pulled back a little bit, right? The, the things that players are a little upset about is more of the human element, right? Let me be a ball player. Let us, let's, 
let's have yep. each other's back. It's like there's like a chemistry void or something or a a void in just untether me from information for a second so I can go be a baseball player, right? That's that is a manager thing. Now, could the general manager and the front office be dictating that hey, we meet we there's a certain amount of roboticness here that we need because we know what's best, right? So if you were to let's say you were to replace Rocco with one of one of the great Terry Francona is one of the great balancers of information and chemistry and human element, right? Mm -hmm. If you were to just swap managers in the division and Terry Francona became the Twins manager for the next three months, mm -hmm. what would your thought be on how far this team can go? I think they could win a playoff game. I think they could win a series. I, I really mm -hmm. do. I, I think the problem here, though, and it's become very clear, and it's weird because when Falvey got here, we heard the opposite of this, and I think it, he put on a good act for it. But it feels like they don't want pushback. It feels like the front office wants you to say, you know what, you're exactly right. But the problem there is you're dealing with a group of young men or guys, alpha personalities at times, as players who aren't just going to agree. So if Rocco agrees with Falvey, that's fantastic. But guess what? The clubhouse might say no. Does Rocco go back and push back? Does Rocco – I mean, it is alarming that that – you know, right now it looks like an enormous answer to this team's problems have nothing to do with with the manager, the coaching staff, or management. Yeah, and when you when you have a bunch of players with track records, or at least like Max Kepler doesn't have have a track record of greatness, but he has. Right. We we saw what he is at his peak, and it's it's much more in line with what he's been doing the last two weeks. But you get on the line, Correa, Buxton, you could go up and down this thing, right? There's a lot of guys that just aren't performing at the level, even like Christian Vasquez. Like, what? How can we get all these guys closer to their to their peak or to their mm -hmm. track record? And unlocking that is much more of a human element, human touch thing than I think people give it credit for. One last thing here on the categories, and then we'll get to the immaculate grid. Uh, one more category for you guys: Matt Walner. The category is Matt Walner. <laughs> so. He now he went 0 for 4 with three strikeouts yesterday. Boo. So maybe he maybe he's cooling off, but he's now hitting 300 with a 407 on base percentage, 33 extra base hits in 61 games for the Saints. Max Kepler is coming alive here in terms of like, well, where do you put Walner? So Kepler's last 14 games, OPS over a thousand with five home runs. Now they just brought Miranda back up because. Royce Lewis is on the injured list for six weeks. He's a third baseman. He's hacking around in terms of like, who's the better hitter? Well, Walner is, but he can't play third base. So right. there's some positional stuff in here. So I'm looking at the current outfield situation. And my thought is like, I don't know. Don't overthink it. Like you're not staring at four future hall of famers here. So where do we put Walner? Well, okay. Kepler in right field. He's been hot lately. I feel like they've been on the verge of saying goodbye to him. I mean, they're not going to do it while he's scorching hot, so I guess we'll put Max Kepler in the safe bin. Michael A. Taylor, he's your best defensive center fielder, but he's just like, he has a 260 on base percentage. It's so he's, tough to justify his bat in that lineup on a regular basis. Yeah, it's pretty important, though, man, because if you, if you well, and, and especially, what the one I love is the Kepler, according to the athletic, you know, what, a few months ago, basically told them I ain't playing center field and they put yeah. up with it. Well, you could, so in theory, you could move Kepler to center field, yes. take a little bit of a hit defensively, but now you open up a corner spot, right? But Taylor's but your best defensive center fielder. Yep. And I do like, uh, that. Joey Gallo has played like 200 some yeah. innings in left field. He hits a home run once in a while. We can, it's funny. He has one of the best OPSs on the team, but we know it's all kind of hollow. And then there's a uh, Judd's guy, Willie Castro, who's played mostly left field, some center field. So He's it's like you Great. You, could, you can make an argument really? for all four of those guys. Like, well, Willie Castro is one of your most versatile players. I'm not saying you should get rid of Willie Castro for Walner. I'm just saying it's funny that you look at those four players, and all of them are like, eh, I don't know. But but collectively, they fill enough holes for you where you're not just going to punt one of them. So it's a weird situation they have right now that's sort of blocking Matt Walner. Well, and here's, and here's what they have to kind of do with, with Kepler versus Walner, because I want Walner's bat in the lineup. The, the the two cards here you can you can you know lay up are either trade Max Kepler to what Judd said for which is probably going to be the 18th best prospect for another team, or 
you trade Matt Walner to get you something that is also bigger because he's a prospect that is actually legit and younger. Now, I don't want to do that personally. And I, by the way, I, I'm Mr. Look, look, at dude, look at all the dudes that are blowing up for other teams yeah. right now that Brent they've Rooker's traded for Mallies and right. yeah, exactly. Spencer so, Steer. I'm much more in line of keeping Matt Walner, flipping Max Kepler for the 17th best prospect. I'd rather go down that path for sure. But that's where they're going to have to draw this line. Do you want to just have the 30-year-old Max Kepler? Do you want the guy who you can control for six, seven years that's going to run into way more bombs? But they don't draw a line, Declan. That's their problem. They don't draw a line. Their line is we're always right. I'll draw the line for them, damn it. That's the problem is we – and look, we got suggestions. We can talk to where blue in the face. It they the, the the twins orchestrated from the players, but also the manager. They allowed a mutiny to happen to basically ignore David Popkins. They had to have a oh, mutiny dude. happen that they have nothing to do with. The manager has nothing to do with it. He closed the door in yeah. which the players also. And this is the other thing to Declan's point about the wild and the comparison oh. to the pre Z suitor teams. I got questions about the leadership in that room. Like who is the leader here? And and I know Correa. I know Correa says he, he is, and, and I'm sure they tra- and I'm sure Correa thinks he he is. Uh, I'm not completely convinced that he's the best guy to be that guy. But my point is, they had an orchestrated mutiny because they are unable to ever admit. You know what? The, the Popkins thing not working. They had to allow the players to take control to feel good about themselves. And that's the ridiculous thing here. That's the thing that's going to hold this t- team back. And honestly, if you are going to do nothing now, like if you are go- going to be like, we're on-, on track, which I don't completely buy, because again, yeah, you've had some good-, good games, but I'm sorry, Kansas City to me is like playing the Saints probably, and that might be an insult to the Saints. To the Saints, yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the other two things, and I think it should become a discussion if things don't change here, you've got to look at this. Your starting rotation has been great. But Sonny Gray is in the last year of his contract. And if there's no way he's going to come back, and if you're going to do nothing else but just stand there, and they won't, you have to consider trading him. If oh, you're going to do man. nothing else. Oh, now the clickbait comes out. And Here's the, the scorner, other, the clickbait. And the other Clickety thing click. that this team has done, too, <laughs> keep in mind this. This is going to seem small, but it's not. This team fired, and I don't even recall his name, their head athletic trainer after last year. Too many injuries. We're going to clean this up. We're going to pop a resta who took over that job, has fully fallen on the sword for Polanco, who came back too quick, no rehab assignment, and now they're like, he's going to have a lengthy one. And Caleb Thielbar came back from the same injury Royce Lewis had, which is an oblique strain. I think he pitched once, and he's been back on the I.L., for since then as well. That means so like, Lewis is going to be out for a year now because he's going to be out for back from he's going to be out minimum six weeks. Yeah. But again, my point is this team cannot admit there's never admission of being wrong. You had to have the players basically say, let's let them let's let it look like they took control. Drives me nuts. It is it is super interesting. Uh, since since that closed door meeting, the Twins have scored eight or more runs in three of the five games, and tickets are available to watch this newly revamped player led offense. So we've got a homestand now that runs through Sunday. You got both. You got one more against Kansas City tonight here on this Wednesday. We're recording this day off. Uh, twins.com slash tickets. Twins.com slash tickets. And if nothing else, it's the best bar in the Twin Cities for. Mm-hmm. For my money, well, anyways. Friday night, Carlos Correa bobblehead night, too. Let's get it. Yes. And there's going to be two different ones. There's <laughs> going to be two different ones. I'm going to try and get in at some point in time, get them both. But yes, Carlos Correa bobblehead on Friday. So get to the yard, uh, twins.com slash tickets. All right, we're going to put uh, five minutes on the clock here. I'm just going to do it with my my phone here because I think we have to have a limit when we do the yeah, immaculate like grade. We can't just sit here all day. Uh... I like this. So uh, this Immaculate Grid, by the way, I don't know, who created this? ImmaculateGrid.com? I, I, I don't know. I, okay. I, I, I feel like it was briefly inspired okay. by John Boy because they, they've been doing these for like a year. So I think Put they the time of, on the clock and okay. Baltimore and Cubs, Rick Sutcliffe. Oh, hold on. Okay. okay. So all five right. Five minutes. All right. Okay. Just to, to over explain for the audience here, it's a, it's a nine box grid where like, let's talk through it here. So we need a Cub who is an Oreo. Yeah. Judd saying Rick Sutcliffe. Rick Sutcliffe. I could have given you Corey, Corey Patterson there. That guy? From yeah, Rick Sutcliffe. Okay. Yep. Making sure. Who Rick Making Sutcliffe sure. is that Je- No, I, I actually don't. No, I don't know who that oh, is. Oh, wow. Wow, Cleveland, dude, wow. Baltimore, Eddie Murray. 
Eddie Murray's a great one. Cleveland, Baltimore. Eddie Murray. Yep. All right. I, I screwed up with Gre- there's a second Greg Maddox that like I just you know clicked. Uh, was yesterday. it his brother Mike Maddox? Mike? No, there was another Greg Maddox. Like the uh, same what? spelling and also like over. Uh, I just saw Greg From Maddox when? pop up and that's why I said, "Hey, like make sure I'm am I looking at the right area here? I didn't want to get burned. My bad." Ed, Eddie Murray, right. can I show off on Cubs Mets here and give you? Of course, Tur- go ahead. Man. Turk Wendell. Oh God, I love it. W e n d, Turk Wendell. He used to wear like the shark's tooth. Uh, oh, zero point seven. Necklace. Eddie Murray again. Let's go, baby. We Cleveland use, Mets. You can't use. The can't same use him twice. Oh, you can't double dip on a guy. Okay. okay. No. Okay. okay. Uh-huh. Fair enough. So yeah. we need a three hundred seat. Let's do the three hundred batting average season. Let's do Cal Ripken for the an Oriole who hit three hundred at least once. Oh, you know what we can do for Cle- Cleveland Mets, Francisco Lindor. Ooh, hold on. Hold on though. But we know that's that's in our back pocket. Yeah. That's in our back pocket. Okay. He, now, did he? Here's my question: Did do we need him for a three hundred average? I don't, I don't think know. he ever hit 300 with the Mets. So we can do Lindor. Right. We could also do Roberto Alomar, who played for both those teams. Sure. Yep, there's actually. But do we, who's a Met that hit 300? Uh, first that come to mind, maybe a Keith David Hernandez. Wright, Jose Keith Reyes. Hernandez? Yeah. Keith yeah, Reyes probably did. Uh, David Wright did for sure. Yeah. Right. Who did ever write? Let's let's go old school. Let's go because we want the we want to be rare here, right? If you're confident on, well, we know David Wright did, right? Yeah, that that's fine. Okay, okay. let's do David. David Wright? Right. Okay. David, David Wright. David Wright? Okay. David Wright. Okay. There we go. Okay. So we're right. we have uh we're, we're two minutes we're doing well here. Three minutes left. <laughs> so here's what we need for the audience. A cub who was a mariner, a guardian slash Indian who was a Met, and then a Guardian Indian who was a Mariner, and then a three hundred hitting Mariner. Uh, Edgar. Gr- Griffey Edgar Martinez. Yeah. Edgar Martinez. He hit three hundred um for Cleveland, Seattle, Cliff Lee. Ooh, that's a great one. Okay. Love it. Yeah. Hit that. Should have been. Uh, should have been. Here we go. There we go. Aaron Hicks. Sometimes you, get, Baltimore. You, get, you, get, you can get screwed up there. Yeah. Okay. So we have two left here and we have uh, two and a half minutes for a. Let's do. So let's do the Guardian Met. Lindor. Lindor, right? Yep. Well, we're kind of dominating this. That's great. Okay. Right, so Cub. We've seen a, a Cub who was a Mariner and we're good. Cub who was a Mariner. We have two minutes Cubs to figure out. I don't remember. I've been a, a long time Cubs Coomer fan. Coomer didn't play for the Mariners, did he? No. No. Did Dave Hollins play for the Cubs? Played for the Twins. I don't remember him with the Cubs. I remember him with the Padres. He was a Rule 5 draft pick by the Phillies. Uh, oh. sh- sh- trying to think of pitchers. Yeah. Yeah, oh, the Mariner who was a Cub. Mariner. Did Jose Cruz play for the Cubs? I don't think he did. I'm trying to think uh, like relievers, too. Uh, Pitchers. Yeah. Oh, no. Catchers. This is, this is what happens with the Immaculate Grid, by the way. You uh, buzz first, through like okay, a bunch first, of them. First base at the Cubs. No. Second mm. Seattle. Dan Wilson play for the Cubs? No. Randy Johnson didn't. I don't think he did. Dan Wilson played for the Reds, oh, Seattle. Who was a Cub? We have a minute um, and a half. Yeah, yeah, that's not good. Hold on. Outfielders. <sighs> Griffey didn't. Um, mm. Mm-mm. Hmm. Someone's yelling at their at, at our yeah, screen. Yeah, no, this is so. And they're bad. right. A cub who was a mariner. Oh, uh, no, no. Uh, did Mar- did Marlon Bird play for the Mariners? That wow. I don't know, dude. That's a poll. I don't know. He played Glenn for the Allen Hill. Did Glenn ooh, Allen? Ooh, ooh. Did Glenn Allen Hill play for the Mariners? Oh, he played for Toronto, right? I. Marlon Bird That's a great Rangers. one. I don't know if he did. Let's let's that can be our emergency guess. We have 45 seconds. Oh god, this is just this is so A Mariner who was a cub. Why there's got to be. I mean, come on. I'm trying to think of pitchers. Oh, there's not god. a ton of crossover between those two teams. Cubs. Glenn Allen Hill, I guess. You know what? That might be our emergency guess. Glenn Just just hover, just hover for a second. We got 20 seconds. 89 to 01. Boy, that's Oh, a... wait, wait. Sir. Okay. Bobby Jernier didn't. And David Gar- Se- Gary David Matthews. Segal. I don't think Gary Matthews was a Mariner. Oh, he's a Sarge. Um, Fowler didn't play for the Mariners. Don Baylor? No, he was a. Don Baylor, I don't think he was ever a Cub, was he? We got to pull the trigger here. Three, two, Glenn All Allen right. Hill. Let's, let's go. Oh! Yes! We got it. Yes! Play the music. Play it. Let's go. <laughs> oh, here we go. We're just going to wave a flag. It's a wild so, flag. Okay. A couple things that have been added in the last week. You see this rarity score? That's his 168. 
So I think so. This was added. Rarity score is calculated as the sum of percentages for each cell you get correct so plus one hundred for empty cell. How obscure, right? Can you be? Yep. So did did we do good on the rarity score? Yeah, I think so. Um, Dude, so, Glenn Allen Hill was traded from the Mariners to the Cubs in 1998, or vice versa. All right, so he played the average, for both teams in 98. The average score is 7.4 today. Uh, 91,000 have played, and the toughest one has been Mariners and Cubs at 53%. Okay, so we're reflective of that. Yep. That's the most great. popular. Oh, Jamie Moyer. Jeez. Okay, we could, oh, Jamie Moyer yeah. was the most popular. That's probably a good one. So these are the most popular answers for each. Yeah, Carlos too, Santana's Judd. an easy one. Yeah. yeah. Ichiro. Oh, man. Yeah. Okay. Wow, boys. Well, nice congratulations, work guys. Nice work there, guys. A job well done. All right, there's your State of the Twins presented by Modest. Modestbrewing.com. Cheers to Glen Allen Hill. See you guys.